Welcome back to the Free Code Camp podcast. I'm Quincy Larson, teacher and founder of Free Code Camp. And each week we bring you insight from developers, founders, and ambitious people getting into tech. This week we're talking with Phoebe Vong Fidel. She is a proud mother of two kids. And at the age of 36, as a stay at home mom, she learned to code and she got her first job as a developer. Phoebe, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And uh, real quick, I just want to do a quick shout out to the many supporters we have in the Free Code Camp community. We have more than 8,405 supporters who donate each month to Free Code Camp to support our charity and, by extension, support the Free Code Camp podcast. And of course, Phoebe, you are one of those people who supported Free Code Camp, um, and we greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Well, Phoebe, uh, we're going to get into your career transition and the many really insightful articles you've written for Free Code Camp about your journey and also your review of like Harvard CS50 and like all the new stuff you're learning as far as like machine learning and things like that, continuing to refine your skills. But I want to start by just going way back to your childhood and the origin story of Phoebe von Fidel. Sure, sure. Um, so I was born in the UK, but uh, my parents were refugees from Vietnam. Well, actually they were um, their parents, so my grandparents actually uh, moved to Vietnam to escape the troubles in, in China. So both my parents were born in Vietnam. And then the, uh, the uh, war in Vietnam happened. So then they were refugees from Vietnam to the UK. Um, so, uh, my brother and my sister were, uh, with them at the time and my other brother, uh, my mum was pregnant with, with him at the time when she was, um, making her way over to the UK. Um, so, and then I was born a few years later in, uh, in Cambridge. So yeah, so that's yeah. where my family's all from. So like two successive generations of refugees, essentially. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's difficult for me to imagine, like, uh, what that was like. Maybe you can give some insight. Just growing up in the UK, um, knowing that that torrid family history, knowing that you're like riven from two different countries, essentially. Like, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was really hard for my parents. Um, they came to the country with literally nothing. Um, they were given like a, a house by the local council and it's literally like five pounds and they didn't speak a word of English. So they took a big risk, but they knew that they needed to escape what was going on in Vietnam. So they, they thought we need to do that for the family. Um, and when they sort of first arrived, it was just, you know, survival really. So they would do cleaning jobs. My dad trained up as a chef. Um, my mom would um, sort of, part-time work in the evenings and wherever she could get and my dad took English classes and they kind of just sort of gradually adapted to life in the UK um, and you know I think they worked really hard as well and then eventually they start their own business because my dad was trained as a chef and that's when things kind of got a lot better for my parents yeah. once they kind of established their own business. And they, they established what in the UK is called a takeaway, what in the US is yes. called like takeout yeah. restaurant. Um, Indeed, yeah. So they, they uh, set up a Chinese takeaway in uh, Gloucester. So we moved from, in, uh, from Cambridge to Gloucester. And yeah, so it was really hard work. I mean, it was originally a fish and chip shop and they started selling fish and chips kind of just to adjust to the business first. And it wasn't doing too well, I think, you know, um, so my dad said, okay, I'm just going to start selling Chinese food. So he adapted the kitchen, um, managed to kind of get a loan from the bank to do that. Um, and yeah, and it was just, it was really hard in the early years. They were open seven days a week, really long hours and sociable hours. Um, so we hardly ever saw our parents, um, but we knew that, you know, we understood why they were doing what they were doing. And uh, yeah, no, then eventually the business picked up and it became one, it's probably one of the most popular takeaways in Gloucester. So it's been there for since 1990 and it's still going. My brother runs the takeaway now. So my parents are both retired. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And you, at an early age, you worked as a takeaway yeah. kid. 
You sent me this BBC documentary, which I'll link to yeah. uh, in the show notes for anybody who wants to, to watch it uh, about yeah, yeah, yeah. kids who grew up very, working in their parents' yeah. restaurants. Exactly. It's, it's very common for the kids to help out because our English is a lot better than our parents. So we would sort of be in the front house, like taking the orders, taking the money, taking the phone calls. So I started working profan about the age of 12, helping out and, you know, sort of doing things like in the kitchen, washing up and like, you know, chopping a few vegetables here and there. But then when I got a bit, little bit older, I would serve in the front. Actually, I, I was kind of in the front and in the kitchen as well. So, and, you know, I would be doing homework when it was quiet at the till, um, reading books and stuff. So, yeah, it was kind of like juggling, working and helping parents with homework. Yeah, pretty much for like. Yeah. And w- would you say like your family was like, they, did they emphasize academics? Um, did they did they have like aspirations of you going to university? Yeah, I mean, they what they wanted to do was to ensure that we didn't have to worry about money, and um, they always said, you know, encourage us to to study and just you know study really hard, try and get to university. I mean, my my mum didn't go to school beyond like her teenage years, and there wasn't much opportunity for her. My dad was like the equivalent, I suppose, of like, you know, high school. Um, so they didn't have much qualification. So they kind of encouraged us to, to you know, take advantage of being in the UK. You know, education will take us anywhere. That's what they always used to tell us. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we just tried to, I mean, all of us tried to fulfill that. Um, three out of four of us went to university. Um, my brother has a PhD, so you know, I think academically we all did pretty well. So. Yeah. And, and, uh, you got into, of course, the very prestigious London school of economics and, yes, uh, I did. yeah, I mean, was it, was it challenging to get into yeah, I mean, to that school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's quite competitive. Um, yeah. I mean, like it's one of those Russell, I think it's part, we call it Russell group, but you know, I suppose the equipment in the U S would be the Ivy league. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I remember putting a lot of work into my personal statement. I did a lot of extracurricular activities. I was part of like a, um, a youth group with the council and I did like lots of like charity events. So yeah, I mean, there was kind of a lot of, yeah, I put a lot of effort and the, the studying alone, I studied so hard, uh, for my A-levels. So yeah, it was, yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the A levels just for context for us, like for an American, I don't know what the A levels are. Is that okay? So, yeah, I think it's a bit different because I think you you have high school and then you kind of have quite a general education in the US, so yeah. you don't specialize in anything. In the UK, we have GCSEs, which is uh, when we're fifteen, sixteen, and then we do like a broad range of subjects: science, math, English, French, etc. And then when it comes to A levels, you specialize. Uh, I did three subjects plus general studies some people do now five subjects but it's very specialized from a very young age so i did english history and politics so very traditional kind of arts sort of type subjects um and yeah and it's just based on those grades really from the three subjects that we do yeah so you had to make decisions about what you wanted to do from a very yeah. early age like yeah. even earlier in the u.s like the the real i think inflection point for a lot of people who are able to go to college is they'll you'd be like two years in. And that's like really the last time you get in college to like change majors before you have to do substantial additional coursework and potentially spend an extra year at school. And that would like, if you're a traditional student and you haven't, you know, done anything uh, to derail your progression through like high school, university, everything, uh, that would be probably around age 20, 21, yeah, where you'd have to yeah, kind of yeah. like decide, okay, this is what I'm going to do. But it sounds like awesome. in the UK, you have to do it a lot earlier. <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 a, it's quite daunting, really, because, you know, you're 16 and you can't well, actually probably have to do it when you're 15 because you need to actually apply to do the A-levels before you get your results. So you, you kind of, I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 15. So all I did was the subjects that I enjoyed. So I followed that kind of logic, I guess. I said, what am I good at? What do I enjoy? And at the time it was mostly English and history. So yeah, that's why I followed. Yeah. And what was that like studying those things? Like, I, I guess, what did you learn uh, during university that 
were you really interested in it? Did your interest in it fade at any point or are you still really interested in those type of subjects? Yeah, I mean, I'm still kind of interested in like, you know, history is a very broad subject, covers everything really. Um, and it's definitely one of those things where I enjoyed just learning about new things. Um, I think studying history it kind of teaches you critical thinking, how to research, how to write. There's a lot of essay writing. And I think those kind of transferable skills are very useful but it doesn't necessarily lead to like a specific career in you know i kind yeah. of envy people that were able to like say oh i want to be a doctor or i want to be a dentist and um for me i was like i don't really know what I, what I want to do but i know i like doing history and you know i like learning about things and reading um so yeah it, was, it wasn't necessarily the the kind of the most i guess savvy career move like you know in terms of um, choosing that degree but yeah I just I just thought okay I'm just happy to study what I like doing um, yeah <laughs> yeah well let's talk about the kind of the moment that you're done with school did you have to get a job before you were like were you working while you were going to school or it... yeah I was working at my parents takeaway so I would go back every holiday so it was kind of like a deal I had with my parents so they would help out with like um living costs and I took out a loan I took out a student loan like most people to help pay for the fees and then um but every holiday I would return back so that was Christmas Easter and summer and I would just work um just to kind of make extra money and yeah so I would do that so that but then during term time I could just solely study and don't have to worry about money so it's quite a good deal yeah and at what point did you start thinking about was there do you remember a specific time when you're like in school kind of living this like campus life and and going back and helping your parents uh do you remember like a specific point where you're like okay what am i doing next like at yeah. what point did you really start thinking about the future and your like longer term uh, career yeah probably like a bit late kind of in my final year i started applying for some internships and stuff and you know graduate training schemes wherever i could and it was really competitive Plus, I kind of, I think I just didn't know really what I was doing. So um, I guess it may, might have shown through the applications. But I ended up doing um, a scheme in the US where I was selling books. I don't know if I ever told you about that. So selling I was books? For the South, yeah, Southwestern Company. So, and I was selling like, educational books, like literally like door-to-door -door sales. Um, it was a way for me to be in the US for a few months and, you know, you sell your books and then you can go on holiday afterwards. But yeah. So I did that for a bit, and that was interesting. Is this was like yeah. kind of like encyclopedia sales or something like that? Like you yeah, sell a bit like that, but you know, kind of with kids' books, and you know, and you would carry around samples, knock on doors, see if anyone was interested. But yeah, and like it attracted like students from like UK or all, all over Europe. I think it's usually like something that enabled um, students to be in the US. So a lot of people just like, yep, I, I can go sell books for a few months and then have some fun. <laughs> yeah that's so cool I did, yeah i did that in my final year and then i came back and then yeah and then yeah i still didn't know what i was doing sort of did some admin work worked for a temp agency for a bit and yeah and it was just one of those things where i kind of thought okay i need money what do i want to do and then i ended up working for a university so yeah fell into a career yeah yeah and you spent quite a while there yeah um do you remember how many years you were there so I worked at King's College first. I think I did that for about six years, something like that. Um, and I, it, it, which is quite funny, I actually worked for the computer science department and I was the administrator. So the scary person that you have to hand in your essays to and they would, you know, I would take them in. So I was the uh, admin person for the undergraduate program. Um, and I did that. So I did kind of university administration um, did that for a few years and then I moved to that's, Imperial that's College. That's so interesting school. that you, you were in the CS department as yeah. admin. Yeah. Did it, at any point, did it ever occur to you like, Hey, maybe I could study computer science. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I personally I just didn't think I could. I was like, you know, Oh, I just, I just didn't think there was an avenue for me there. I thought I would have to go back to school and study and then do another degree. Do my that was a game, but it was, it was quite good because I would, have talks with lecturers and stuff and sort of I did have some exposure you know to to what they were doing and 
Um, so yeah, I kind of, but I just never thought I was capable, to be honest. I just thought, well, well, you know, I come from a completely different background. I don't want to do it. And then like, I can't do it. I did, it did sort of maybe sow the seeds when I was working there. Um, but yeah, but nothing sparked at the time thinking I'm going to transition. Yeah. And then, and then you continued working as an academic administrator at, at a different school, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I looked after the MBA students, so I worked and moved. Actually, I worked, first of all, I looked after finance students. And then, so I, I kind of moved a lot. I think it's uh, in my LinkedIn profile, but yeah, I moved quite a lot internally. So, you know, it, it's, it was basically a very similar job, but I would move to a different, slightly different um, program. So, but I stayed with the MBA program for quite a long time. Um, so yeah, looking after the MBA program and like organizing all the electives and all the admin work associated with that. Yeah. And, you know, an academic administrator, that's, that's basically like an entire career in itself. And mm. you can go to a university, at least in the U S and you can see people who've been doing it for like the last 40 years and are getting yeah. ready to retire. Yeah. I and mean, did you think that that was what you were going to do? You were just going to stay? And yeah, I mean, admin? I, that, well, that's, that was the thing. I mean, I was like moving up the ranks and I was, you know, doing a good job. I would get really good feedback from my managers. And then uh, I think, I think I had like a, you know, when you have like your annual sort of, uh, what is it, appraisal. So I remember talking to my manager and it's like, you know, you, what, what's next? You go, we can definitely put you more on the management track. And I was like, you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I was like, no, I don't want to do that. But then, so what happened was I ended up moving back office. So I switched over to teaching and quality instead. And that wasn't student facing. And then I did like, so I did the maternity. I kind of did that to escape. So I didn't have to answer questions about, oh, what are you doing? And do you want to be a manager? Like, I was like, no, I don't want to be a manager. But I didn't say that because I didn't want them to sort of like disregard me. I just wasn't yeah. sure about what I wanted to do. So. I moved over to teaching quality, which is way more back office, um, uh, like hidden admin, I guess, um, and did the maternity leave cover. And whilst I was doing that, I would um, see loads of kind of inefficiencies and like things that could be automated. I was like, hey, this could be automated. Okay, I'm going to go off and do this. And my manager was at the time was she was really supportive. She goes, oh, yeah, whatever you want to do, if you want to improve it. Really? Um, yeah. So she was like hugely supportive. And then I like basically um made things a lot easier uh, for uh the person who i was placed replaced for maternity leave to come back and i made it, the, their job a lot easier in terms of just streamlining things and make uh, so less time it would just some, sometimes i just used to think why are you spending so much time doing this we can automate this um so then my manager wanted to keep me so she created a position for me and i was known as Wow. a special uh, IT projects officer or something like that, because that was my interest. And she said, you, you obviously want to do it. Um, yeah, so then I kind of went down the project management route for, so I would find work in other words. So she goes, you find anything that you want to improve, you know, uh, let us know and we'll see if we can get the funding for it. Um, so I did all kinds of interesting um, projects with her. So I think one of the big projects I did was an exam marking system. And, um, like, like grading exams. Yeah. Cause basically it was, it was really inefficient the way it was done. It was basically a lot of spreadsheets being passed to a lot of, you know, from one hand to another hand. And I said, there should be only one single source of truth and that should be the marker in putting into a system. So then from from that idea, they said, okay, maybe we need a different system. So we looked at like off the shelf products and there was nothing that met our needs. So then, uh, we worked with an external company to create a bespoke piece of software. So I was kind of in charge of creating the requirements for Interesting. that. So, so you're almost kind of like a product manager. Really. Yeah. 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 I was, and I was kind of re responsible for the delivery of this product. And yes, yeah, so I kind of like was on the other side of what I do now. And it, yeah, it was really interesting because it kind of gave me an insight in how software projects work. And whilst I was doing it, I said, yeah, this is really cool, but I kind of want to be on the other side, actually developing yeah. it. And that's when it really clicked, you know, and then I said, I want to do that. And, um, 
So you yeah, want to be not point. not the product manager kind of like giving the the specs and and trying to like ask for specific features but the developer who's implementing yeah. those features. Yeah, I thought that would be really cool. I was thinking I would rather build it to be honest than to give out the requirements. I'd be really good if I could do it. So I found myself kind of moving more towards that. I was already kind of automating things and streamlining things at work. Um, and it just seemed like more of the natural progression. Um, yeah, so yeah, so that's kind of like really kind of roundabout way to, to how I got here. But that's that was probably uh, in my kind of late twenties, about then, when I sort of thought, yeah. no, I really want to do something else. Yeah, and maybe, maybe you can describe like th what transpired from that point. Did did that spur kind of like a renaissance in terms of like learning new things? I mean, did did you kind of refocus a lot of your free time to like learn more, or or like how did you go from that? to working as a software engineer. There's still quite a bit to the story. Yeah, yeah. That I don't want to so, hear. Yeah, so we, luckily we kind of in within like um the team at the business school, we worked a lot with the edtech team and I I had a word with one of the lovely um ed technologists at the time and she recognized it said how do I said so how do I get into more technical role? She said, "Oh, well, maybe you should start off with like HTML CSS." you know, see how web pages are built. That's probably the easiest entry point. So then I got sent off on a course. So um, a three day HTML course. And the instructor was my husband, but he didn't know at the time. So Tarek oh. was my instructor. <laughs> Tarek. And yeah, uh, yes, yeah, indeed. <laughs> Software uh, architect at Adobe currently. Yeah. So he, he was yeah. your instructor. That's how you met him. Yeah. So he used to teach, um, you know, web technologies at the time, JavaScript. So I attended the three day course and then we kept in touch and, you know, we emailed and then, um, yeah. So it was kind of like all this in conjunction and, you know, uh, then, uh, but we, yeah, so we met and then, and then we started dating later on and yeah. And it's kind of like from there, he sort of became my guide in terms of like, he said that, Hey, you know, what about you go learn with, at the time it's like Coke Academy, don't go there with Coke Academy. So I sort of delved a bit into it and like dip my toes in and, um, did the, you know, a few of the exercise, but I was never fully committed. I just thought, yeah, this is cool, but it wasn't consistent. It kind of wasn't like hundred percent in it. Um, and then got distracted by like, you know, the people pros, we got married, had kids and then then the nagging feeling came back when I was re thinking about returning to work. What do I want to do? So, yeah. So that's yeah, kind of where. I... And you you talked in your article about how like you had two kids in pretty rapid succession. You had just had yeah. one and, and and finished your maternity leave when you realized that you were going to have a second one. And um, yeah, maybe you can describe kind of that that mental process because I imagine a lot of the people who are listening to this have kids or, or, or are planning to have kids and kind of like what that journey was like in terms of the substantial increase in responsibility associated yeah. with having young kids. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it, yeah. I, when, with my first child, so with Rami, when he was born, I just had this, I guess I had an idea of like, it would be hard, but I didn't think it was going to be that hard. Um, you know, he was, he just was a baby that just never slept. So I was very sleep deprived for the first six months. It just, it just went by really, really quickly. And I was exhausted and, and um, yeah. And it just, all I could think about was like baby looking after, make sure I can, you know, he stays alive and I can keep him healthy. And yeah, that pretty much dominated like um, my thoughts really. Um, I didn't think about anything else. And then um, yeah, when I went back to work, I found out I was pregnant again. So I had, yeah, two kids there, how old, I don't know how many months they're apart. So there are 20, I said two babies under 20 months. So yeah, they were basically like twins. And that was just exhausting really. So I had two kids and then when I had Lan Yu and I was on maternity leave, so that's my second. So my, when I had my daughter, it, it was probably when I sort of, it was kind of that time when I was preparing to come back to work. And I said, either I can make a decision now and quit my job 
or I can actually return to work and just pay like a whole load of childcare and like move back closer to London. Because I actually moved away. Um, I moved towards my parents to get help. Um, so they helped me a bit when I had uh, Lan Yu. And um, yeah, so it, I think it was that time when, again, it just kept on coming back. What do I want to do? I can take maybe the easier route and just carry on doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Or I can take the plunge. And I just thought, well, I may as well. So I, I, it was quite a, a pragmatic decision because, you know, we saved a bit of money. Um, I had, I knew kind of approximately how many years I could go without working. Yeah. And, and um, you say pragmatic decision to like leave your career as an edu yeah. educational administrator. I mean, yeah. you, you told me that like, just the cost of having kids in daycare was so substantial yeah. that it's practically like eroded all the benefit from you working. Anywhere. Yeah, it was, it's, it's with, with one, it's manageable. It's about uh, one and a half thousand per month. That's pounds. And that's a, that's about like 2,500 yeah. US dollars. Maybe let me just yeah. check 1.5 K pounds to USD. Uh, yeah. So it's about 2000 US dollars for yeah. any of our international or U S listeners, I guess in this case. Um, yeah. So that's substantial. So of course it's twice as much if you have yes. two kids, right? <laughs> that's $4,000 well, yeah, a month. Basically that's a lot of I money. Mean, that's more than most, uh, most people I think working as administrators here in the U S make. Um, would, yeah. I would basically be working to cover the childcare costs. So I'd be working, you know, it, it would just be to like maintain my career. <laughs> yeah. I would have like no money at the end of it. And so, I don't think yeah. it's like a controversial statement that people working in childcare institutions as, as great as they may be at taking care of kids, that's no substitute for the kids actually being with their moms, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it was just a chance, you know, do I want to kind of, what's, you know, I'm paying for someone to look after my kids, and whereas I could probably look after them and, and there was no like benefit in terms of money. So, I, so we sort of talked about that and then I said, so what if I do that? I said to my husband, what if we do that? And then I can maybe look into the whole career transition. He said, yeah, that's fine. Um, so yeah, that's what I did. So I decided just to make that decision so that we can survive for this many years. If you don't work and you stay living with, with the parents. Um, yeah. So I was lucky because not a lot of people have yeah. that opportunity where they can have the sort of financial support in a way that I did. Um, but, yeah. and, and you moved back in with your parents as another kind of yeah. pragmatic uh, decision. Yeah. So I kind of moved like next door to them. So they had mm -hmm. like a, um, the, on top of the takeout, there's a, like a little flat. So we stayed like literally on top of the takeout. So <laughs> it That's was like, wild. It was like, like a my, yeah. A single building, a single structure, yeah. like so much of your childhood is spent working there. And now as a woman in her thirties, you know, with a I husband and two kids, you're going back. <laughs> like, if you don't want me, because in the U.S. historically, there's been some stigma about living with your parents. But I moved back in with my parents um, during college uh, to to also save money, for example. And I know a lot of people did. And I think it's become much more common now, and it's not yeah. stigmatized like it was back in like the the '90s and stuff. Uh, yeah. Where you're like, oh, you're just living on in, the, in your mom's basement was what what people would always say to me when I told them I still live with my parents. Uh, like, um, but, but was that like, how did that feel <laughs> to move back it, in? It was a bit strange. I mean, like I moved out when I was 18 and then to come back when I was in my thirties, it was, it was a little bit strange. I mean, I guess it helped that I wasn't actually living like in the same, we had the li same living space. So it was a separate flat, but literally like my, my brother was downstairs and my parents went too far away. It was like going back to childhood because when we when we were when i was younger we in the takeaway cause we, the takeaway actually moved location so this is the second location when i moved back so it was like a bigger place but in the first takeaway we were literally living on top of it it was a house on top you know it was like four kids to a bedroom you know it was very tight space and it, it did have that kind of feeling again when i moved back in but more space <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it, I mean, all my family are quite close together. I was the only person that actually moved away from my family. Um, so for me to return, it was, yeah, <laughs> it was, it, but it was fine. It was quite nice to sort of be with family again and reminisce and all the rest of it. But yeah. Yeah. 
So you're living in the same building as most of your family uh, on top of the takeaway. Uh, yeah. I guess the new takeaway, the second takeaway. Yeah. Um, and you're taking care of your kids yeah. basically full time. And yeah. at some point there is a decision like, I want to learn to code. Yeah. Yeah. How did you like, what were the circumstances? Take us back to that moment when, or maybe that, that period of time in which you started to realize, Hey, I can really do this. I can really become a software engineer. Um, so I'm just trying to think of uh, thinking back 2017. I was like, I told my work, I said, I'm not coming back, but I had to obviously fulfill like three months of work. So I would work remotely for them for three months. Um, so I could, benefit from the maternity leave that I had so I took off like a year which is you know it's really good in the UK you can that's quite normal after you have a kid but you have to return to work for a certain amount of time so I did that and my manager was very supportive and she said that's fine you know you know you got to do what you got to do um and then when I did that I was like oh god I've got no safety net I have to do it now because I've done it I've made the commitment not to return to work and I just thought you just have to throw yourself into it because you know it's not a decision to take lightly it's very scary um i had so Tarek, my husband was like a source of support so he said that you know i can mentor you i can guide you but you have to put the work into it you have to be committed and you know um it's going to be hard so yeah so that yeah yeah many conversations to reach that point um you know he said that i'm capable as long as you can practice and practice you know, you're capable of doing it. You can code. So yeah, I kind of trusted his judgment. <laughs> awesome. Well, I mean, it sounds like you had a great resource in literally a, a teacher of yours yeah. who is now your husband, who was kind of helping coach you. Uh, but as anybody who's learned to code knows, like at the end of the day, it has to be your hands on the keyboard. You yes. have to get in the reps. Uh, you have to learn all these different concepts yourself. Maybe yeah. you can talk about how you went about that massive endeavor <laughs> and what, what yeah. your first thoughts were, how you, how you kind of got started. So before like, um, I made the commitment to quit my job, uh, we decided to research platforms. And I said, I mentioned before about Code Academy and then Tara said, Oh, there's this new kid in the block called free co-camp. And you know, it's, it's really good. Heard some good things about it. Why don't you try it out? So, um, he took off a week off work to hold my hand during the first week of study. And he says, okay, let you go off, try, try doing the interactive exercises. If you get stuck on something, just let me know. Um, but yeah, I think so. He said, stick with this. It seems like a good curriculum. You know, it's all the things you need to become like a front end developer. Um, and yeah, so that's what I did. I started off with free code camp, um, and started off with those exercises where you get a little green tick when you get it right. And it's nice, like confirmation that, you know, you're doing well. And then, uh, I remember like it was all going well. And then, uh, I got stuck and I was like, what's this, what's a div? I don't know what a div is. And then he goes, it's a container. And I go, but it's a container in the container. And he was like, and I was like, what's the point in that? He goes, you'll, you'll, you'll realize later on. And then he says, why don't you go off and research? So, you know, try Googling it. And, and you know, because you, you, I'm not always going to be here, you know, so if you don't understand something, Google's your friend. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how I got started. So I just carried on. I persevered. If I didn't understand something, I would just go and Google it and became quite a good Googler, really. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that was my kind of core curriculum was through CoCamp. Um, yeah. I did sort of offshoot and like, because I kind of quite, I like to learn through different sort of mediums. So mm -hmm. I, I love like tutorials, like video tutorials, when you walk through a project and you can sort of see how concepts are being applied. Um, so I would use a lot of that and also Khan Academy. So for the fundamentals, I would yeah. go back and use that platform as well. It's a great platform, but yeah, but pretty much I stuck to it, completed I think about the, um, the first three certificates. Yeah. So you probably and, did the uh, responsive web design, yeah. JavaScript algorithms, data structures, front end libraries. Yeah. Um, and you might've done like the data visualization. Yeah. Yeah. I did that one. I love yeah. that one. So 
yeah so i did all those and i just carried on and i just you know i remember like just banging my head um against the wall sometimes with some of the the projects like creating the roman numerator you know number converter thing you know things like but i just sat there and i really didn't want to find out the answer i would just sit there and just persevere and yeah it was it was a lot of kind of nights but i really enjoyed it i really enjoyed the problem solving side of it so um yeah so it was kind of hard but i was very uh, fulfilled by what i was doing by the study yeah. and learning so you felt forward momentum essentially you yeah. felt and, and that's one of the things i always tell, tell people is like at some point you'll start to feel yourself kind of like almost your brain growing yeah. <laughs> if you will you'll feel the kind of like the the boundaries of your your knowledge being pushed forward yeah and it's a it's a really invigorating uh feeling it and is. so at, were there doldrums were there periods of time where you i i like to joke that like most people quit programming. I quit so many times, <laughs> but I, I quit learning programming. Yeah. But I, but I, I would keep going back. Right. Did you yeah. have any of those moments where you're just like, ah, or yeah. 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 The, yeah I think I, I wrote about it in my second article. Um, so yeah, I think it was the time when I started looking for work and I thought, okay, I'll just join all these like freelance platforms and, you know, do remote work, it'd be great. I'd be able to land customers. And but it was just, it just didn't work for me. I wasn't able to land any customers. And, so and then my like, are you talking about like, like Fiverr yeah, and yeah. Uh, like out, Upwork? Uh, yes, what, yes. Yeah, those, those yeah, types of I joined those two. websites? Yeah, you know, and I thought, oh, I'll be good just to get a bit of experience. Doing that. But it just, I think what it did was like it completely dent my confidence. I thought I can't even get any work. I can't compete with, I got zero ratings and how do I get a rating by getting work but no one would give me work so it's like a yeah the chicken and the egg circle. problem yeah and then I just thought oh no I can't, I can't. And so and so after that I thought it really the whole imposter syndrome just kicked in at that point and then I took a break from coding for about two three months um yeah and then I yeah so I did that and what, what was time, that time like what, what were you if you don't mind me asking like do you remember what what your days were like when you did you feel relief like ah you know i have resolved no, to not I, do it or, felt, or were you i felt really down i felt like a failure um because i set out to to do this and i felt like i can't do it you know and it's just all these like negative thoughts just kept to yeah you know, it's just spiraling um and i just needed to reset you know and sort of step back and think about what i was doing and so what i did was I stopped and then when um, I think it coincided with the time with my uh, manager at Imperial, she wanted like temp work. So she said, you can work remotely. We'll probably need you like a couple of days a week. Um, so I did that. I just thought, okay, I'll do something different. I'll just work. And then that kind of distracted me, brought back my confidence. Like I can actually do work. I can actually work. Yeah. And I'm worth something. Um, and then I thought, what did I enjoy about coding? It was studying. So I went back to studying and then I continued with the specifications. I did, I think I did the back end one, the free cone camp. And then I think the biggest sort of gave me momentum again was doing hundred days of code. Yeah. On Twitter. So describe 100 days of code. So you commit to doing a hundred days of code. You have to code for at least an hour a day. Um, so I did that. I followed that model so i would and then i would put updates on twitter and like use all the hashtags and like follow other people who are also doing 100 days code and it was just a really nice community because you sort of see other people's progress um people support you they give you like yay you know well done and it was just really nice and i got to know quite a lot of developers um and aspiring developers through the platform and yeah so that kind of brought back my confidence and gave me consistency as well because it you know i had sort of announced to the world i'll do 100 days of code i better you know make sure i fulfill that um so yeah i did that and then completed certifications um also decided to not work for fiverr or upwork and uh created a, a website for my um, sister-in-law's business so she mm -hmm. started like a, a nail 
business and she didn't have a website or, or any web presence. So I just offered my services for free and said, oh, I can create a website for free. If you're yeah. willing to give me a chance. And she did. She said, yeah, go ahead. I don't mind. So I did that and yeah, create the portfolio, you know, all the things. So I kind of had that momentum um, after I did the 100 days post. Yeah. You, I mean, you've got to start somewhere. And uh, I remember my first freelance project was my friend uh, who ran like a consultancy. And I was like, hey, can I create like he wanted me to develop some sort of simple tool. It was like a basically a crud create, read, yeah. update, delete, I think. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the crud acronym that you hear, like a crud app is what some people yeah. say, like, like very basic, like interfacing with like the database. I think it was like a Ruby on Rails app or something like that. And um, yeah, and my friend Jimmy Epperson took a chance on me. And as a result, I built that and I learned so much. Just having a project, having somebody that you're accountable toward makes all the difference in terms of getting out of bed every day, you know, getting on the keyboard and pounding out some code and pushing through, you know, well, I've got to figure out how to render, you know, this SVG, you know, table with all this stuff that like I'm pulling for the database. I'm going to figure it out. Right. Like yeah. th there's no other option really. I'm not going to, I, I can't let my friend down. He's trusted me with this. He, he's paying me a token amount of money. He was like a thousand bucks or something like that to build this for him. So, uh, I need to do it. Right. And it sounds like similarly, once, once your sister had given you that responsibility, did you feel that that was like a proverbial shot in the arm in terms of motivation? Yeah. yeah. And also it was just like, I had to do things, learn new things like how to host a static website. And that's when I wrote the AWS article because mm -hmm. I thought it was, I found it really difficult. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. This documentation is like a, you know, it's so, it's, it's so complicated and I'm going around in circles and you know so I was I was also like writing like I wrote notes for myself and I thought okay if I'm having trouble doing this then someone else out there has got to have trouble and this will hopefully help clarify how to do something which is should be relatively easy so yeah so I think it, it, it I learned so much doing that like I learned about like you know buying domain how to host a website um about AWS about S3 buckets and it just kind of took me down like a different like area, um, which I'd never gone down before. And it just like, and it was good because I was thinking, oh, this is like great. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm learning as I'm going. And that's pretty much web development. <laughs> yeah. I'm mean, even doing that now. So yeah, but yeah, but I was enjoying it. And I think that was the key. Yeah. And one of the things that, you know, is really interesting about your coding journey is because you did this kind of freelance, you you were able to work with a lot of potential clients and build up your chops that way before you actually yeah. started applying for software development jobs. Do you remember how long you'd been coding before you even applied for your first developer job? So I was coding uh, towards the end of 2017. Um, and so that's when I started to learn. And then I created my first sort of website in April, I think the mm -hmm. following year, 2018. And then that's after I did that, I was still studying. And then I decided to approach like people who I knew that needed help with creating yeah. websites. So I would just say, Hey, you want a website? So, and that, and that was much better because they knew me. Um, and they kind of thought, you know, Oh, that's really great. I trust you. Sure. We, you can build my website for my business. So I did that, uh, for a couple of businesses. And yes, yeah, so it worked out really well. I just did WordPress sites because it was the easiest yeah. thing so that they could update. Um, and, you know, they had a, like a, a GUI and stuff. So, yeah, it, it just, um, yeah, so it made sense to kind of go down the WordPress route for those websites. And it gave me the experience to then apply for developer jobs. And, yeah, that was my industrial experience, you know, cause, because I had actually worked with clients, got the requirements, followed through, delivered a product. Um, but yeah, it was really helpful for me. That's how I kind of got my foot in the door. That's yeah, how I got and, my first job. And that, but that was like a like more than a year after you'd started learning yes. the code that you yeah. even started applying. So, uh, a lot of people, I think, maybe start applying for jobs way too early. Um, yeah, and I always <laughs> tell people if you can freelance first and just get a few projects into your portfolio, that that can really yes. dramatically increase the likelihood of people calling you back yeah. for interviews, right? 
Yeah, I think it differentiates you from those who are just, you know, got a few certificates. If you can show that you've got experience and you've got your track record and you can get references from those people, it really helps. Um, so I always say, just do it for a friend, just create a website, you know, you know, so it's the best way to learn and it's yeah. the best way to kind of get that experience, um, you know, when you're learning how to code. So you're finally ready to apply for front end developer jobs and yeah. you've got, you've got this practical experience. Like how do you go about, a, what was that decision like? How did you know you or, or think you were ready? Um, and how did you go about applying? Um, so, so Tarek at the time was saying to me, you're ready to apply, you're ready to buy five. Like, and I said, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm dragging my feet. I'm, I'm studying this. I need to complete this certificate first. I need to, there's always something. You always try to, uh, put barriers in, uh, because I think I knew subconsciously it was going to be really tough, but I read a lot of the cases like, you know, applying for a hundred jobs. And, um, so I think it was the summer of 2019, was it 2019? Mm -hmm. Hold on, let me see think. So we moved. Yes. So then um, my son was starting school and it seemed like a good point to, to start applying because, you know, kid goes to school, got, technically got a bit more free time, even though. Yeah, like six hours, uh, depending on like yeah. the length of school, but it, but it can, like my kids are in school. Uh, they actually just got home. So if you hear like a bunch of yelling and <laughs> screaming okay. in the background, my kids are very loud. Uh, they love to like sing and you might even hear some piano later. Who knows? Oh, or good. the software might tune <laughs> it out. But, um, but yeah, like being able to drop my kids off at school, I walk them to school in the morning and I just drop them off and I'm like, for the next six or seven hours, I can work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So that had to be a massive change being able to drop your son off at school and yeah. like, have so that time. Yeah, so I was dropping off at school and then I can drop my daughter off at like um, nursery, which is like daycare. Mm -hmm. um, and and then I could have like most of the day back. Uh, so I used that to start applying. But yeah, I think the the applying process for me was um, like I contacted recruiters. I joined like, you know, I also looked for jobs on like LinkedIn and I think with I can't remember some some recruitment agencies like I think Reed, um, and that's how I did it. I just kind of just applied the, the down the traditional route and then um, heard back and got a couple of interviews with two different companies. Wow! And so you, you got a couple come that's very heartening, I guess. Like yeah, you're immediately yeah. getting it's, positive feedback. Yeah, yeah. So do you remember how many like, jobs hey, you actually you? applied for? I think I put this in the article. I applied for four. Four like jobs. And you got two responses. That's a 50% yeah. hit rate. Yeah. So <laughs> Pretty like, remarkable. Like <laughs> I was, was, I was interviewing right. Logan Kilpatrick from OpenAI, and he said he measures job applications in the hundreds <laughs> because it takes so so many job applications. But but clearly you, you were well prepared for the yeah. job hunt if you were able to get interviews from like two right off the bat. I think, you know, because I was thinking, am I just lucky? I don't, I don't know. Or maybe it's just a combination of things. But yeah, I mean, I I had my CV ready. I had um, a friend review it. I had Tarek review it. Feedback, you know, kind of tweet my LinkedIn profile. So it was all kind of like a combination of things to, you know, give me a the best chance. perfect storm of preparedness. Yes. I think so. that's what I'm going to say. Yes. I, I was prepared. <laughs> I mean, I think I had mentally prepared for months for this and then, but yes, I was really surprised. I mean, the first one, um, the interview was, you know, it all went well. They're very curious to sort of like uh, talk about my my background and like, oh, you're trying to transition. That's really interesting. So I think a lot of it was probably just um, thought I was an interesting person. Like, why would I do this? Um, so that kind of came up in both interviews. Um, and then, yeah, so I decided to, it was, it was, it really laid back. It wasn't like anything tough with the, uh, the interview that I, with the company I actually had my first job with. Um, I met with the lead developer and then he said, I reviewed all your, your portfolio, you know, your websites that you've done, you know, and I think you're capable. So do you want the job? And I was like, wow. Okay. So, that was yeah, the interview. So I met, yeah. It was like pretty much I mean, like talks about. You didn't make what, you go up and like invert a binary search tree. Or... No, no, no whiteboarding, nothing. So it was, it was just like, you know, he had done his homework. 
um and he said that you know i would like to I'd kind of because i'm happy to like you know hire you um but you know so we, we just talked about the company what they were trying to do what i would do what the role involved um and then i also met with like the directors of the company it's a very small company and they seem all like nice people so i was like okay oh well, it's like nothing that i've ever done before which was mapping never done anything to do with that yeah so said, gis Yes. It, uh, is what you're working with, like global information systems, GIS? Ge what is Ge Geographical Geo information systems. GIS. Yeah. I'm just going to look up GIS. I'm sorry, just for the sake of, because yeah. I have this rule that if there's like an acronym, I'm going to uh, say it. So it's Geographic Information yes, right. Systems. <laughs> yes. Yes, that was right. <laughs> yeah, but, so, but everybody yeah. just calls it GIS. So like, yeah, everyone just calls it GIS. Yeah. So, so I went with that. Um, um, so I created maps. So we worked with local councils. I was in charge of creating a drawing tool. So whenever you kind of, if you're like a resident and you need to get permission to create like an extension, you would have to draw like on a map where you would like your extension. So I created- An extension for like a, like a house or something? House. Like you want to- Yeah, that, for so example. Like, okay. Yeah. Um, so it was like a drawing tool for a map. Um, and I used, yeah, it was just like, I mean, huge learning curve. I had to learn about GIS, I had to learn about like projections, map projections and coordinate systems. And I work with mostly um, an open source library called uh, Open Layers. Open so Layers. I think Leaf, yeah, Leaflet's the other one, which is probably a bit more yeah. common, but Open Layers has way more functionality, I think, than Leaflet. So I worked with that and that was, yeah, very steep learning curve. It, really interesting though. Um, and, you know, uh, learned a lot in that role. Um, I was so happy when we, uh, you know, deployed the, um, the tool that I made and these councils were using it. And I was like, hey, <laughs> so it was just really satisfying, really, um, when I finally did that. But yeah, it was, it was a good role to have, first role. Yeah. Well, what was, like, how has your career unfolded since then? Like, have you mostly just been working, you're still working with GIS a lot, right? Um, not anymore. So um, I moved on to, uh, so I was with that company during the p pandemic, the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it was, I was working remotely anyway, so it wasn't too much of a change for us. And then I lo was looking for my next role and decided to uh, sort of incorporate a bit of, what I used to do, so in education. So I work for um, the National Foundation for Educational Research, NFER. Oh, and okay. they do and that's, a, that's a government agency. No, not quite. I think it's it's a non-profit charity and they do a lot of educational research. So they work quite a lot with, I suppose they do a lot of advisory work, a lot of, so they do education research for primary age school children. And they had, um, so they were, hiring developers for um, creating an e-assessment system okay. for primary school age children. Cool. And, I'm, um, I'm learning a lot yeah. from just like what you're talking Like Obviously, I got the last two like assumptions wrong. Uh, yeah, no. But but no. working, so working, you know, obviously Free Coke is a charity, so I'm familiar with the charity world. I just, when you go across the Atlantic to the UK, I have very little understanding of how yeah, things no operate worries, over there. Yeah. But, but essentially, like, could you summarize the like the mission of the organization you work for, like what, what the, the big goal is? I think it's just, um, I think the big goal is to, uh, oh, how, to how should I summarize it? Um, it's just to kind of make the educational life of children better, like how to yeah. enhance it, how to improve it. Um, they did a lot of research during the pandemic and the impact on children. Yeah, There's a lot of interesting research that comes out of the um, NFBR. Um, but they also do like outreach to Africa as well. So I know there's kind of like assisting governments in Africa on how to kind of improve their educational programs for children. And it's just, it's just nice because, you know, I thought I'm going to be able to work on the products, which potentially my children are going to use. And they actually did, you know, they actually went through, um, so they were responsible. So there's, um, oh, oh, sorry, my airports just come out. Um, so, um, so for example, in, uh, reception age children, so that's four to five, mm -hmm. there's a test that you have to take, which is called, um, the reception baseline test and reception baseline um, test. Yeah. And it's, um, all 
children in all schools have to do it. And uh, NFER were responsible for um, sort of developing and, and deploying that test for all the schools. So it was just, it was just I, I kind of wanted to do something meaningful. Uh, and, uh, and this was like the perfect, I thought this is the perfect role for me. Um, I get to sort of increase my experience and also the mission, you know, trying to, you know, improve the, the educational lives of like, children. So, yeah. So you get to wake up every day and feel like you're helping in this organization's mission. And ultimately by extension, you're helping a whole lot of kids around the world. I hope so. Yeah. And it's, you know, the, the kind of, so we haven't actually released the product yet. It's, it's going live in the summer, the mm -hmm. summer. Um, but yeah, so it's been a lot of work. So I've been with them for almost three years and a lot of work has been, has gone into it. Um, and you know, I kind of, and I'm really kind of on the front line in terms of what I'm doing. So I actually create the interactions, which the children use to complete the test. So I don't know if you know, like, you know, like reading eggs and those platforms, Mathletics. So if you could see like, um, a question and you see where the kid has to drag or input an answer. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who builds those interactions for the system. So, so I would imagine you're doing a lot of like user research, a lot of like yes. accessibility considerations. Yeah. Performance, yeah. like web performance compatibility, stuff like that. Like is it, is so it going to run in a yeah. browser? Yeah, it runs in the browser. Yeah. So yeah, all that stuff. So I, you know, it has to be double A accredited and there's constant discussions because a lot of the, uh, the uh, sort of researchers who want the interaction are not necessarily up to scratch with accessibility concerns so you know we've had to sort of really educate um a lot of staff on what to take into consideration um in terms of accessibility like the buttons have to be a certain size the color contrast so yeah it's 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 nice because it's a lot of cooperation with a lot of teams um but yeah so i feel a lot of responsibility as well at the same time to make something yeah. really intuitive yeah, I mean, if you think about it, not to put even more weight on your shoulders, but like the work that all the people are doing is going to almost be interpolated through the work that you're doing. Like you're the front door through which yeah. all the kids are going, right? And if that front door doesn't open properly or if the front door looks, you know, not like it doesn't have the curb appeal or something like who knows, right? So yeah. it sounds like the because you're so close to the end user, um, yes. but that's got to be really exhilarating at the same time yeah yeah and it's nice because i get to test it on my kids so like, i created like a uh another type of like you can draw shapes and things called drawing shapes so um my first user was my was lan Yu because i got her to like control it and i could sort of see the trouble she was having i was like oh this is really good you know she can't click on the dot they're too small you know so it was it's just really nice and she, she finds it fun she gets an idea of what i do for a living yeah. Um, so yeah, I get to test it on my own kids. <laughs> yeah, that's got to be a really cool experience, like seeing the very work that you're doing, and, and uh, her being able to look up to her her mom and and know that her mom's, you know, not just filing <laughs> reports at some yeah. desk in some giant, you know, Byzantine, you know, structure, but is actually like developing something tangible that she yeah. can see and play with. Yeah, it's it's really nice and she's really interested and she sort of asked me, Oh, have you done something new today? You know? So yeah, I'm just quite happy that, um, what I'm doing has like a, uh, you know, it's, it's really important. It's a really important key part of the system. And, um, and it kind of makes me work harder because I kind of want to do a really good job because yeah. there's people like I knew who are going to be using it. And I just think, well, there's a lot of responsibility there. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, amazing. Uh, again, I want to congratulate you on just that, um, that arc, that narrative of going from, uh, you know, the child of refugees, uh, yes. who themselves were the children of refugees, um, who started a small business and kind of lived like in America, we would call it like the American dream. Maybe there's yeah. like, it's like the, the, the British dream or do you have a word for that yeah, over there? Yeah. 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 It's a similar thing. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really happy for my parents because I think at the end of the day, they, what they got out of it was financial stability and, um, you know, the business was really successful and, you know, they lead a good life now, but it was just 
a lot of grafting, a lot of hard work. And yeah. I think that's what they instilled in me. I mean, like working in the, the takeaway, like every weekend, um, in the evenings. And it, it, it was, yeah, I, I think that helped when it came to um, the, tr- the career transition because it kind of gave me that tenacity to just like keep on going, you know, well, I kept on saying, you've worked hard on this before. Remember the days in the takeaway when you're standing for 12 hours, you know, so I think it gave me that, that I think that work ethic. Um, so, you know, as much as, you know, I didn't have the childhood, which a lot of kids have when you get to go on holidays and, you know, have nice things. What my parents gave me were the tools to succeed the tools in life. And I'm, succeed. Yeah, I'm really grateful for that. Um, and they, they, yeah, I'm just, I'm still hardworking to this day <laughs> because of that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what they gave me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So having kind of completed that, you know, autobiographical arc of the podcast <laughs> interview, I want to jump to practical takeaways for people, yeah. uh, you know, especially parents, uh, especially moms who have young kids and uh, a lot of people who might find themselves having graduated with a degree that they really enjoyed studying, but isn't necessarily mm. directly applicable to what they want to do next. Um, mm-hmm. And and so, so maybe I can just fire off some some questions to you, Phoebe. To uh, so, what would be your advice looking back with everything you've learned? If you were to meet someone who was, let's say, like you know, thirty four, uh, mm-hmm. which I think was about the age that you were when yeah. you started learning the code, right? Uh, maybe a 30 year old mother of two, um, <laughs> uh, who was living in the UK, like very similar, like, uh, maybe you could even think of this as like, what if you could send some advice back to yourself, just send, send that advice back, you know, five or six years or however, however long it's been since then, um, to, mm-hmm. to maybe cushion the process or, or maybe even some tips to be even more, uh, steady in her ascent. <laughs> yeah. what, what would you say to her? Um, I think I would say that, which I've said before on some other podcasts, is which is don't compare yourself to others. Um, I did that, you know, when you see stories of people getting jobs at, after six months of studying and, you know, landing a job at Google, <laughs> after yeah. six months. you know, that, that does happen. And, you know, but that's rare. And everyone's circumstances are different. So, you have to cater your learning schedule, your coding schedule around yourself, around your responsibilities. You know, you, you can have young kids, you can have elderly parents, whatever that may be. And you just do the best you can. Um, and I say that, you know, even if it's just for 15 minutes a day, it's something. And as long as you've learned something new today compared to yesterday, that's what counts, you know, and it's, it's, it's cumulative. So you, you you kind of like need to make sure that you try and keep the consistency as well. Yeah. But in saying that, like I was really inconsistent because kids got sick and I got sick and, you know, things come up, but you just try not to become disheartened and try and jump back onto the wagon and start learning again. So it's a lot of stopping and starting when you're a parent because something does pop up, you know, you're not in your twenties and you're single, no responsibilities. You've got kids. Um, it's going to be hard, but it's possible. It is possible. Yeah. And it, yeah. I mean, you're, you're living proof <laughs> that it's possible. <laughs> yeah. And, and I know many other uh, parents who in their thirties um, transitioned into tech, uh, you know, as I've written at length, uh, probably everybody listening to this has read my book or something where I talk about it, but I, I learned to code at age 31. Now mm. I didn't have any kids. Kids add an entire additional layer of, you know, complexity and, and time constraint and energy <laughs> level, yeah. you know, limitations, I, I guess, how did you do it? Like, were there any things that like really helped you gather, like, like, uh, gird your loins, like muster your strength <laughs> so that you could do this so consistently over two years? Um, this, I've had this discussion before, cause people say, you know, why did you wait until you had kids to transition? Um, and I think my answer is that I didn't really value my time before, you know, I would like go off and play some video games, and go shopping, wherever, it, you know, and then, but when the time was like taken away from me, when I devoted my time to my kids, I realized how valuable it is. And so whenever I could sneak in like half an hour here and an hour there, 
I really utilize it. And I think that's what having kids for me did. It actually made me value my time more, which is kind of ironic really, because you have less of it. But um, yeah, so I'd say that, yeah, it, when you have less of it, you value it. So you make use of the time. And that's what I did. And every time I just, instead of like watching Netflix or something, I would just go off and study. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the temptation wasn't there because I just thought, I haven't got much time. I have to do something useful. Just go and do it. And then, and I kind of got used to that. I kind of got used to like just my life with kids and coding for a while. Do you um, think you built up like, do you think you built up kind of like more resilience over the process? Yeah. Like each day, like, like you said, Netflix, things like that, distractions that you used to, yeah. in, you know, indulge in. Uh, just kind of melted away and they almost weren't considerations. Do you think you kind of like built up this tolerance for, I guess, the the frustration and the potential tedium of learning programming? Yeah, I think I, I did. I did. I mean, I remember like early on, I used to get terrible migraines. I think it's because the new neurons were like, I was creating new neurons in my brain. So yeah, I mean, I did build up a tolerance and I used to feel so uncomfortable studying programming. I just like, and then you kind of get used to that feeling, like feeling uncomfortable and you kind of end up just like, I don't know, for me, it just, you build up a tolerance and then you kind of, you can study for longer and you can, and it's, it's weird because you kind of, it compounds the knowledge. Yeah. So things are not so alien to you once you kind of learn the fundamentals. Um, so I think that was a big thing for me. And then I thought, oh no, I understand that. I understand. So it, it, it took me less time to understand difficult concepts as I was, you know, as I learned more and more. Was there an inflection point? Like where did you, did you have like, do you remember a specific moment where you felt like suddenly the wind was at your back and you were being pushed toward your destination? Yeah, I think it was when probably this after my sort of down period where I kind of like, just stop coding and then after that it was like a massive push i remember like just being like really motivated and i think that second wind was like for me that was it and i knew that i was going to make it then yeah. i wasn't sure like the first year of studying whether i was actually going to make it and i always thought oh, i can always go back to imperial college or i can always go back to education it's fine, it's fine but then i thought no i'm going to do it and then i like i really psyched myself up like mentally you have to kind of like build that up and and it's one of those things where you, you're almost like cheering yourself on. It's like an internal dialogue. It's really strange. That's why I did. I kind of like, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Um, and yeah. And I just thought to myself also, I can do it. And then I can also write another article for you guys. <laughs> so yeah. Thought, yeah. I'm going to get that job and I'm going to write and I'm going to like celebrate. So yeah, I think that it was that win and it just, yeah, I was really motivated. I don't know what it was. I think it was doing that hundred days of code. I was really psyched. Um, yeah when I was doing it and yeah, just having the support as well of other people and telling, you know, and they're in the same circumstance as you. Cause as much as like having my husband there as a mentor, it it's different from someone else that's also kind of going through the same process. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, it's nice to have that someone else doing the same thing as you and you're both trying to make it or a few of us trying to make it. So yeah. Yeah. Someone community. who's like basically the exact same point in their journey as you are. Uh, yeah. and, and it's almost like you're on parallel tracks, like looking yeah. over high five each other. Yeah. That's so cool. So 100 days of code, I, I feel thrilled that that was a big, uh, element in your, uh, your rise as a developer. And, uh, I'm going to link to that. Uh, we, I, I recently posted an article. We've got 100 days of code going on on free code camps, discord as well. So even if you don't like Twitter, uh, yeah. you can go on discord <laughs> and do it because a lot of people are on discord now. Um, and you can meet lots of like-minded people and you can hang out with them and, and, you know, potentially pair program. And it, it is finding kind of a community, finding your tribe, so to speak. Do you mm. feel that, that that was helpful for you? Like finding other people? Did you, do you remember a period where maybe you felt like you were in isolation? Like, was there a lonely mm. period of learning? To yeah. Go? Yeah, indeed. Yeah. I think, I think that also didn't help, you know, when I kind of fell into that sort of like period when I wasn't coding and I felt really lonely because I was on it was either like kids or I was coding on my own um Tarek was working away a, a lot at the time so he would be away for sometimes most of the working week so it was just me and a desk with a laptop and 
yeah I mean I suppose one of those lessons learned when you go back and if you could tell yourself go back and talk to yourself and say what you would do differently I would say probably not for me engaging with the community earlier I think that's mm-hmm. that's a key thing um so you know and you can do that remotely like I know other parents it's just not possible for us to go to meetups and um and there are different mediums so you can find your support not just in person you could probably find them you know I, I found them through Twitter at the time um and yeah and I just reached out to people I think um Jackson Bates was one of the people I actually reached yeah. out to at the time very chill and, uh early yeah. contributor to Free Code Cube. yeah so he was really nice he would you know he wrote a really long reply saying because I said that what well, I said well, I remember the question that she posed him I said so I'm about to go on the job hunt like how am I supposed to get a job when there's a 21 year old that will be able to work longer hours and like you know learn faster and doesn't have kids as responsibilities and I remember his response was um you know don't forget the experience that you've got you know you've got all that working experience it does count and you know don't compare <laughs> don't compare yeah. yourself to don't the, compare yourself world. to other people right yeah so that was um I remember and I you know he was you know we, we kept in touch actually um kind of back every now and again and yeah so he was one of those people where I knew that he made it because he used to be a teacher um and yeah so I kind of contacted people who made a transition and the number of people that actually reply back is you know it's great you know they they, they always have time especially other free co camp alumni so yeah definitely yeah. Help. Well, Phoebe, I really want to thank you for making time to come on the Free Code Camp podcast. I've been meaning to have you on for so long because you and I have been corresponding for, I think, like, I don't know, like four or five years. I'm trying to look like, that, yeah, yeah <laughs> a long time. Yeah. Uh, and and it's been it's been amazing uh, to to watch your progression and uh, from somebody who was just ambitious and learning to code to someone who now works at a big charity developing software that's going to be used by a ton of kids. So it's very inspiring. And I want to thank you again also for writing these many articles you've written. Uh, I'm going to link to some of them. I'm going to link to your review of the famous Harvard CS50 computer science course, perhaps the most widely taken course on earth at this point. Yeah, it's a great course. It's a really good course. It's amazing. And they keep coming up with new additions every year. Uh, so yeah. we just published like the newest version of the lectures, which David Malin isn't wearing a mask anymore because because like, the old one you <laughs> had to wear a mask the whole time because of the pandemic. Uh, and yeah, and your article about going from a stay-at-home mom to landing your first developer job, I think it provides like a really good roadmap for a lot of other people who are parents um, to to follow. So I'm going to include that as well, and then I'm going to encourage people to follow you on Twitter. Um, do you have any parting words, wisdom for people before we sign off? Ooh, um, I'm just trying to think now. Um, just be consistent. I think just try and be consistent, be patient. And, um, yeah. And just, if you've got the motivation, you can do it. You can transition. 100%. Well, thank you again, Phoebe. Uh, everyone listening until next week. Happy coding.